Welcome back to Modern Education right here on 90.1 KZSU Stanford. I'm the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, here in this studio once again for another fun and exciting episode. I'd like to bring my co-host on the air here, Emily Kiles. Hello. Hello. How's everyone doing? I, I think How are doing, you doing? I'm, I'm fantastic. You know, I can't, <laughs> honestly, I cannot tell you enough how wonderful it was to take a week off last That's week. That's right. You had a nice little vacation. I did. I had an actual vacation and it's really funny because I was looking at my calendar and kind of thinking through the previous months uh-huh. and it turns out something like 18 months have gone by without me taking more than a day or two 18 off. 18 months? Yeah. Which oh is insane. My goodness. It's like no human being. So you deserve this little break. I really did. And you made it possible letting me yes, have a week of off course. last week. So it was pretty epic. I got to admit, honestly, very refreshing. <laughs> uh, nice to have some time to just unwind a little bit. Um, yeah, definitely. I didn't drink too much or anything. So that's a pretty good start for mm, a vacation. It's an actual break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking, doing some reading, relaxing nice. a bit. Catching some uh, some good music tunes. It was really great. Yeah, good. very that relaxing. Nice. Yeah. It's always good to run the holidays. Right? Yeah. Take an extra yeah. time for yourself, even. And yeah, Take we deserve break. it, right? I mean, I think um, Americans in particular are so overworked. Oh, and, yes. I mean, you know, vacation is sort of like a fantasy more than it is a reality in the in the workforce. and Just something I've just started to get into within the workforce. Something... You mean fantasizing about a vacation? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, more like, because when you're in university, you have those structured breaks. Right. And now that I'm uh, kicked out of there, well, I wasn't kicked out. But... Kicked out, meaning you got a degree and left? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it feels a little bit like getting kicked out, right? Now I have to uh, it's like look you forward out to, to, I don't know, maybe two years later, I'll have a break. <laughs> like you said, 18 well, months. Well, yeah. I mean, let's be honest here. Nobody's going to give you a break. So it's always about taking the time you need yes. and finding ways to sort of make ends meet, uh, you know, psychological and emotional ends meet in between yeah. all the hustle and bustle we have going on. And Which kind of makes me laugh. I'm thinking right now of like you're saying taking like taking a break, mm-hmm. which makes me think of speaking of breaks. What will we be talking about today? That's a great transition. <laughs> we should, you know, I think it fits very nicely with our little introduction yes, here because it? It just we are going to be talking today about taking a break from government via shutdowns. Yes, when there is not shutdown. a budget in mm-hmm. place to be able to run the government properly. Yeah. So. I personally barely got to dive into this topic, and I'd love it if you could help me get up to speed as far as, like, what is a government shutdown? Why do they happen? What does it actually mean? And do we even care? Should we care? That's a lot of questions, so just take whichever one you want. Let's start going. So, I mean, one thing to start off by saying is that this is a partial shutdown, not a full government shutdown. It's like a... like partial kidney failure, is <laughs> I guess, sort of, yeah, sort yeah. of like that. Some right? part Your of the government is still failing. working a little bit, but yes. not all of it. And this, like, okay. what's reviving parts of that side of the government is the finance. So there's been a there's a financial year, and it's set, but every year between October to September, and their deadline basically is on the 21st of December. So their that's why this always to... happens like right around Christmas yeah, and winter yeah. solstice times, yes. right? Yeah, I, <laughs> so, I guess we're, we're setting our government regulations around the pagan calendar. Is that what's happening? Maybe that's what's yeah, actually happening. <laughs> makes too much sense It's anything, been right? set and basically going in with the 21st, there were a couple things that were not decided. And the number one thing, which I'm sure probably familiar with, okay. was the um, basically budget for the wall. For Trump's border security. I thought, I thought Mexico was going to pay for that. Why do we need to even worry about it? Because that is all talk, my friend. What? I thought <laughs> I thought when the president said something, it meant something. Is oh, that not, well. That's not sorry true to anymore. Uh, you. But that's what he's trying to make happen is what he said to actually make it happen. And you have a very split Senate, which you have currently the Republicans are overruling. They're ruling in majority. Um, and the two sides cannot agree on how much money, if not what money, should be spent. And Trump is asking for about $5 billion. And I think they're starting to level out to about $1.2 billion, if I remember. It might we're be $1.5 billion. We're going to spend over a billion dollars on the stupid wall idea. This is, and it's becoming a reality. And it's almost like a sad compromise that is huh. going to happen. And Trump, in fact, has 
threatened that if there is like if this doesn't work because this is a bit of a big scandal itself trump mm-hmm. has said like i'm gonna make this happen i'm gonna shut it down i'm not gonna blame anyone else but me like he kind of wants this idea that well, i've shut I mean, down the government and he's already nobody, done it three times nobody cares like if he gets blamed because he doesn't take responsibility for anything but i so. think it's almost like in a sense of back to hollywood and being in corporate business uh-huh. good pr like or bad pr is good pr so like, like this is kind of like some statement he's making, whether or not it looks bad on him. Right. It's something that is pushing up towards like I can't remember exactly how much has been raised, but on GoFundMe they've mm-hmm. raised. Oh, I wish I had this number in my head, but they raised a lot of money for the wall or for the wall. So you this know, is and publicly funded right, for the wall. Right. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a funny thing because I think a lot of those types of fundraisers. I mean, I don't know for. Sh- sh- for certain, for sure. Mm-hmm. I don't know this for certain, but what I do uh, suspect is that there's probably fundraising going on on things like GoFundMe for this that are sort of a uh, fundraising sham to get people to think there's a lot of political or you know social backing for an idea like this. And what it really is is like political, a- political action committees dem- donating money in other people's names to make it look like there's a lot of money in, and people in support of an idea like this. It's a possibility. Yeah, I don't know Especially for sure. Especially open that's... sourced. Right, right. Um, And this is a very big topic because it's, I mean, to me, it doesn't make much sense. You mean the wall? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think most experts agree with you, yet it doesn't seem like reason or research is really part of the equation at this point, which no, is kind of sad. Things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, the thing about a wall is like I'm, I'm thinking back to like storming the castle back in, you know, medieval mm-hmm. days. Right. They built walls. Yeah. And they were helpful for certain things. Right. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, is if you have a two day storming of a castle, a wall could be very effective. But if you have a prolonged 10 year storming of a castle, mm-hmm. that wall is going to be crumbling. That wall is not going to stop people from sneaking in and politically finagling their way in and all these other things that are sort of going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. I mean, fly to Canada and just walk across the border, right? It's really not that hard anymore. No, there's it will end up like literally bring up new barriers to entry. (laughs) Sure. There are now it's almost like a complicated situation where you have yeah one side which says that. A wall will, if you think about it, just like simple logic. If I build a wall, you can't get over. And there was even one point where Trump mentioned that he was going to put in his plan like spikes on the top, which is not in the final definite planning that Senate is looking at. So that's just Trump talking. It's Um, like the the little spikes they put so birds can't land on top of fences. I don't know what it looks like, but it mentioned (laughs) that it said spikes. And I find that a bit extreme. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if he started cutting heads off and putting them on pikes. Oh, no. <laughs> Trump. Gosh. I mean, it's, sound, it's funny to laugh about now in six months when it starts happening. It won't be so no. funny anymore. I've already had two young children die in custody at the of the border protection. Right. At least supposed to be protection. Right. Um, right. Holding these asylum seekers who was what Trump called the caravan. And now these people are in TJ trying to seek asylum and it's flooding their borders. And now that you have the government shut down. So this is really interesting and a little bit ironic in a slight sense Mm -hmm. of how. So it's basically the border uh, control, border protection, as well as like TSA. They are all currently working unpaid. So they... If you think about this almost in like a psychological way, I mean, maybe it's an assumption. I haven't talked to any TSA guys and seen how they actually feel about this. But I can imagine if I'm not getting paid for the job that I'm doing and I maybe find the situation already been very frustrating, I'm afraid that these jobs aren't getting done efficiently. Not to say that there's like a certain efficiency that needs to be done, but I wouldn't be doing it with the 100% effort that I feel like needs to be done. Well, you know, I might be able to... (laughs) to, to to quell your fear a yes, little bit please. here. Now, if I remember correctly, I can't cite the exact source of this at the moment, but if I remember correctly, the TSA has almost no track record of catching anybody doing anything wrong. There mm-hmm. have been, you know, almost no actual instances where the TSA caught somebody and prevented some sort of like actual real threat. So if that's true, which I think it is at least reasonably true. Mm-hmm. 
that means it doesn't really matter. This whole job is really, I think, at some Define. level, it's it's more of a keeping up appearances of security Definitely. to make people feel a little bit more secure, but also maybe on the flip side to keep us a little bit in fear. Mm. Because when people are in fear and they have this sort of looming threat of danger, they're willing to accept a lot more loss of personal freedom and rights. Yeah. And the TSA, I think, largely is in place serving purposes uh, more psychological in nature than they really are preventing real crime. Because mm. let's be real. I but mean, either, either way, without a paycheck, yeah, you end yeah, up. Yeah getting more frustrated as what you're doing like that's not worker rights at that point but it is the government job so it ends up falling into the government shutdown right which his shutdown is about border protection yet you're having this backlash oh, where I they're not the getting now. yeah they're not getting their pay they, the thing is they will um typically what happens is after a government shutdown there will be a, a proceeding that happens and they pass a bill to usually refund and repay the people who have lost their their yeah their check, sure. um, but unless you're living like if you're living paycheck to paycheck, then it's a problem. And there's a you mean number. Like if you have to pay your rent that week, and yeah, you get paid, then you wouldn't yeah. be able to pay. Um, there is about yes, there's about four hundred uh, four hundred two and twenty thousand um, federal employees that remain on the job. But won't get paid till the end of the shutdown. Mm -hmm. And then about 380,000 um, workers who are uh, fall under that, who are working or put on furlough, which is they're just kind of leave of absence. You don't get paid. You don't get scheduled. Sure. Um, so there's a lot less staff, which results in ultimately like what we're seeing in national parks, for example, is especially over the holidays, trash is building up. Because there's no one there to maintain, like, but because the national parks are open, but there's no one to maintain the space. So they still have the facility open. They're still collecting the fees for people to come in, but mm -hmm. then they're not providing like basic sanitation services and things of because that nature. Because they don't have any employees who can be paid. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah that's um, that's crazy. And I really love the point you made too about how if we care so much about border security, why are we shutting down the government and not funding yeah. our supposedly border security type of agencies and things of that nature, and right? Honestly, that we're just remembering now, but while I was looking into this too, Trump said, if this isn't handled, if this doesn't happen for my, if I don't get a budget for my wall, then I'm going to shut down the Southern border. So there will be no, I mean, I don't even know if this is in within his like legal ability, if he can he just doesn't take either, down, sure, the, yeah. like shut the border. But mm -hmm. when I was reading this article, it was basically talking, like telling of it as a legitimate thing that could happen. I'm like, that would be Was this so on Fox News? No, it was not on <laughs> okay. Fox. I don't get my sources from Fox, okay? <laughs> I do that already. I just got to grill you a little bit. I mean, it gives a, a nice little other perspective. Sure, sure. sure. But uh, no, I did not grab this from Fox. <laughs> So it's just seeing this play out as well as like thinking in mind, like one, a lot of people are uncertain of how long this is going to happen. Um, within this year, there's been three shutdowns, one that was two days or I think it was two days, two, three days. And the other, which was six hours. Um, That's not so bad. That's just a day it's off. It's not bad. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. No, the, with the six hours one, it didn't have any impact, really. Okay. Okay. It was just a disagreement. Um, I could use like a, a whole country shutdown just on Mondays. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of sick. I'm, I'm over not. Mondays in general. It's furlough Monday for the rest <laughs> of our lives. I don't think anyone's going to complain. I mean, we do work too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a little time off. I think I but, distracted you with my forever Monday furloughs. <laughs> forever <but>. Monday. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically going into thinking about how... Well, one, how Trump is spinning this in such a manner that it seems so extreme mm -hmm. to then as well spinning it in a way that is affecting people. Like, the thing for me that I really struggle with understanding about government shutdowns is why. Like, mm -hmm. I understand that they don't have a like they have a disagreement in budget. How are we going to be? How are we going to spend the money? But how come everyone else has to suffer Right, right. Because of their disagreement. Oh, man, I did read about this. And yeah. I don't actually think I have like a very well-formed way to <laughs> explain that. Okay. But 
Um, my basic understanding is that this was a relatively new law mm. passed um, within maybe the last 30 or 40 years. Mm. And it's a very much um, only a thing in certain countries that have a presidential style of government and a segregation between different parts of government too. So um, mm. I believe like in England, something like this would never happen because of the way their parliamentary government is set up. Don't think it yeah. would always uh, defer to make sure there is a decision getting made, or at least um, the default is to just reuse the funding if you haven't come to a solution yet. Mm. And what happened here is we had, um, you know, I wish I could cite this a little bit better, but we had go to Wikipedia. It has a <laughs> little bit better, um, better citations, I would say. But the point is, is we have this system set up where we chose to have a shutdown if there was a problem. Mm. Now, I don't know who would think that's a good idea or why anyone would spend the time to create a law that just creates basically a gridlock when there's a problem. Yeah. I feel like uh, just as a, personal observation it seems like this really just comes down to a political tool right what what's like what does the tool do well so think about it from the standpoint of if you have say you know uh, uh, a political divide in your in your governing houses right mm -hmm. maybe like we have right now where republicans and democrats are having trouble getting along mm -hmm. now think if you introduce a tool such as a government shutdown as the default if there's a problem mm -hmm. it's essentially like a default filibuster where you can stop any kind of forward movement and progress simply by disagreeing long enough to make that shutdown come into effect right so it's just a way to get people to say, okay, fine, fine. Kind of, yeah. It's like maybe a way, yeah, it's a great way to think about it, I think. A way to force a decision. So is that a decision well made? I don't think so. Yeah, I'm I, still in, like, I'm still interested to hear, yeah, what's more of the history of why was this enacted? I find that interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, seeing it play out now, it seems pretty... Like, ridiculous. I, I would say ridiculous. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to describe it. And you know, there's this, um, there's always the the difference between trying to get things done and trying to safeguard. And mm. it's, it's it's a difficult dance to move, right? You're trying to kind of dance right on the knife edge between making something functional and giving a way out versus sort of protecting the status quo, so you're not, you know forcing uh, they call it like rule by the majority right mm -hmm. so you don't want the majority to just be able to tear down useful laws just because they have a majority yeah so you know it's always tough to put these safeguards in and I th i'm sure it had it maybe a logical argument enough at the time to get passed and there was probably some legitimate reasons and even historical reasons that it seemed mm -hmm. like a good idea but that doesn't necessarily mean it's working right I mean, I'm thinking now of a case, I need to look back at my notes, but it was 19, 19, I think it was 1960, I feel like I'm probably saying that wrong. Um, <laughs> when was Bill Clinton in office? Bill Clinton was in office. I mean, that had, that was the 90s. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I really got that off. 19, I, didn't, I think that might've been my little dyslexia right there. 1996. Hmm. Okay. Um, not 1969. <laughs> No, that's Don't a worry. totally different era. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, a similar thing happened where it was one of the longest, actually, I believe 22 days. And it was over education and health care. Yes. And there is one other that I'm forgetting. But they basically, it's a really similar story where you have two sides disagreeing. They can't agree on how this money will be spent. Typically, this is seen when there is a majority, like there's a president who has one idea and then the Congress has another or how how this like kind of just really how if in simpler terms, terms, how a debate plays out and you have two people who are opposing if it's on a t like around the time when they're trying to make something really radical. Obama with Obamacare, government shutdown, trying to put into medicine, into everyday for people accessible and right. Republicans weren't ready for it and they weren't having it. <laughs> so, and that was exactly what was happening with Bill Clinton. I believe, yeah, the longest government shutdown was 22 days. Um, 
So overall, they've never gone over a month, but 22 days without pay or without full staff Mm -hmm. is a problem. Like if you are working in such a high, high mass, like job where people are, for example, Medicare, Medi-Cal to, yeah, if you're seeking asylum, visa, passports, those, all those systems are now delayed. Right. And especially for things like social security. Yes. Social even, security. Too. Even if, you know, even if you're the, the checks for people already on social security may be going out, mm-hmm. there may be nobody in the office to take any of the new requests yes. for days yeah. or weeks or months or however long the shutdown goes for. And so that's, um, you know, people who maybe most likely have legitimate financial need to survive and legitimate claim to be able to collect social security aren't even able to be They're seen. able to, yeah. Right, right. And it's things like that that are, you know, not only that actually, but also the the cost of taking that shutdown and then ramping things back up afterwards. Well, because it ends up coming out of our government again right. to give them back the money. Right. So we're not saving money no. we're not changing the the overall outcome we're just delaying it because of uh not having complete funding and i actually found yeah. uh where this law came from and what it's called it's called okay. uh, uh, reminding myself because i didn't take good enough mm-hmm. notes but it's the anti-deficiency act uh-huh. and it started in 1884 with the major amendments in 1950 and 82 and it basically prevents the government from entering any any contract that's not fully funded. Mm. So the problem is when you don't have agreement on where the funding yes. will go, yeah. this comes into play to say, basically, we cannot enact this contract until it's been funded, Yeah, which seems actually like a reasonable thing to say. You go, okay, I don't want to put my government dollars into a program that doesn't have any money to complete it. It's like, you know, it's like sending your kids to school without lunch. It's not going to go well. Mm. That's a horror. I don't know if that's a good analogy <laughs> oh. or not, but it kind of yeah. sounds like it, yeah. right? I mean, think about that. If you send out a policy to get something done for a social service or a government contract or military or whatever, and you don't have the money to do it. This is where you get sort of uh, aborted projects like unfinished bridges and unfinished housing developments yeah. and things like that. It's because people take on the project without actually having the money to finish it. Mm-hmm. And that's the point where, I mean, if you think you're wasting money taking a few days off, try spending $10 billion on a government project, but not having the next $10 billion to finish it, mm-hmm. right? That's a huge, huge expenditure that you can't just write off, right? Mm-hmm. So it does, I mean, from that perspective, you could even say it's like a, a pretty good idea. I could say possibly for the sake of the funding, like for the agencies that are not funded, mm-hmm. um, but it just it seems so strange to have just certain parts of the government just not function. Well, yeah, yeah, especially since some of those parts of government are so integral to just yeah, daily life. It's pretty much essential. And I think in general to have that kind of strange like mix where you have just like the government and their ideas and then our general understanding is very divided. Sure. And then the sense of like how do like how do you breach the like human side, which is because at least my concern at this point is that it there's too like there's a lot of government shutdowns happening. Like, it there's does, been three this it year. It does seem like it's happening way more often yeah. than ever before. It feels like it's being abused as a right, right, as like a political tool instead yeah. of like a necessary protection. Yes. Yeah, and that I think maybe um, cuts to the heart of why this is such a problem because mm-hmm. if we're using legitimately intended laws intended to protect and you know preserve our spending habits and our government funded programs and then that law is now being used as a political pawn to sort of manipulate the process of funding yeah that's a problem right well, as soon as it becomes like yeah, a political game right. manipulate it does i mean that's politics it's right, sad. Right, right. Um, I do want to mention, though, that there are what's labeled essential services, which will always continue to operate no matter what. And these listed is actually is border protection. And this kind of falls into, yeah, they may be able to 
they'll have their workers but won't get paid immediately it can fall into that so it's a bit also eh. and but, i think sometimes it, mm-hmm. it turns out that it's only certain employees that can't fall under that like um, yes critical demographic typically send, the higher up like the big positions will right. actually they'll be on uh they'll go on leave of absence right and it's more of the on the ground but let's say not good majority isn't all there yeah. Um, but we have border protection, in-hospital Medicare, air traffic control, law enforcement, and power grid maintenance are all safe. Safe. I put air quotes. Right, right. right. And strangely enough, which is a little tangential here, but yeah. the post office is safe as well because yes, it's post self-funded. Office. So the post office isn't waiting to get a government hand back to make their their stuff work they fund themselves and they don't pay out to government separately mm-hmm. so the post office mm-hmm. is also protected and i think maybe even a reasonable model to think about how things like this could be avoided mm. because if certain parts of government are able to fund themselves and able to sort of protect their working costs that seems like something we should look at yeah. more they do have a plan there is when i was looking into this there is a set I don't remember the department's name, but there's a department that they go to, which they have to say, hey, I have this plan for the shutdown, okay. get it approved, and it's good. Like It's good checks and balance. Like They make sure that they have a plan. There is a set of things that they're, they're going to do, not just complete chaos. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So there is that hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we always hope somebody has a plan. Yeah. Because things go real wrong when nobody's when no driving the ship, a... right? <laughs> yes. I don't true. think that's how the Titanic went down, but you can imagine that might be a decent analogy. If they tried to have a plan. <laughs> You're like, well, the Titanic went down because it was an iceberg, but also because nobody was actually steering. <laughs> <laughs> I always you go for the one analogies, job, one right? Job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got a fun fact yeah. for you here. Turns out in the 1960s, less than a third of Americans agreed that the government is run by big interests. What do you think it is in 2008? You said 3%? Less than a third. Oh, a third. Um, more than a majority. Like It's, gr- it's greater 70? than 70% in 2008. Wow. And that's, you know, 10, that's pre-Trump. Yeah. So I would wonder what that would look like now, but I would also say... That is a real indicator to me of the loss of confidence and the loss of perception of democratic control people have had in the last 40, 50 years. Oh, for sure. I mean, look at who has as well the most wealth. Like I was talking with someone, okay, well known that at least California is the fifth wealthiest um, like hub in the world. Yeah, yeah. And so, okay, what if the possibility of California breaking off? And you're saying just how all of this, like the way that governments are really structured now, it's like, yes, we have these rules, we have these regulations for companies, but who has the most money are these big companies. Right. Um, It's not so much the government, it's these companies which are ultimately making the big decisions like Amazon. Owning right. all of its servers, all of the servers for the most part. Amazon Web Services is taking over the world and most people never even heard of it. And that's terrifying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there is some history and I can actually cite yeah. it this time more Let's directly. So there's a little history about where this whole government running the country through corporate interests mm. comes from. Mm. And it turns out there is a, a court case, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission which basically gave corporations the First Amendment right to spend unlimited funds for advocating election um, uh, for candidates mm, really? or different things in federal office. Unlimited. Unlimited funds. When was this? Do you have uh, a I don't date? have a date down, That's actually. Okay. Um, wow. But, but the point is, is it tied physical wealth of companies and corporations to the political system yeah. saying, you know, corporations are people and they get a vote just like anybody else right and you know you vote i could see that as something like being put in because companies have a lot of money and the government wants the money Come, yeah give us your money well, type yeah of thing. exactly and it works really well for the the companies who want to protect their interests yeah it works really well for the politicians who need funding to get reelected. yeah and sadly a large and maybe the largest part of a politician's job is fundraising 
Oh, most definitely. So there's a real conflict of interest yeah. there because if your job is, you know, 50% or more fundraising and you have the ability to get unlimited funds from certain extremely wealthy, quote, individuals, mm. that's my air quotes for, the, <laughs> for those of you at home. Uh, Emily can see my air quotes. I so can they're, see they're not, all the hand they're motions. Not, they're not for her. Yeah, I kind of get a little <laughs> Italian sometimes, don't I? I'm not Italian, but I like to talk with my hands, apparently. Yeah, bellissimo. <laughs> Where's the, the pasta? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, went a little too, I went too far with that I'll one, I'll microwave it later. Hey, that's a Mario. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this idea of giving citizen rights to companies really changed the game for what was happening in political arenas and funding. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom here, so I think there's actually some ideas that can help fix this problem. Yeah, you mentioned one earlier, which I found really really in innovative yeah and Good. it's it's not that innovative honestly it's been around for a while but it's the idea but of, i haven't heard of it before so it's oh innovative well it's to innovative me. to you yeah and that that, was revolutionary. that's all that matters because as long as i look smart in front of my co-host <laughs> like i'm good everyone on the air i don't get to see you guys that as much so she's she's impressed <laughs> she's got a smile <laughs> okay so this idea is called tax choice mm -hmm. and there's a there's a set of experiments and research uh, done by a researcher from the University of Pittsburgh called Kate Lamberton, which is a great last name. I love that Lamberton. I don't know. It just really rolls off the tongue. But Kate Lamberton did uh, a bunch of experiments and a bunch of work around tax choice. Mm -hmm. And the idea of tax choice is that it allows people to take some percentage of their tax payments. Say, you, you know, you give 30 percent of your pay and now you can say 10 percent of that you can allocate to some causes that you think deserve more of your own money. Mm -hmm. Now, as things happen right now, we have compulsory taxes where we don't really have any clue where our money is going. Mm -hmm. Now, one initial thing that people have tried that is actually a, a decent idea is tax receipts, which just basically tell you where your money's going. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you put your money into taxes, you file your taxes at the end of the year, you get a receipt that says, hey, 70% of your money went to, you know, military okay. and 20% <laughs> went to elementary schools yes. and, or, you know, more like 2%. <laughs> I don't know, something like that. The point is you get to actually see where your money's going. And this yeah. helps. This idea actually does make people feel better because there's an idea of um, the value proposition of something that's distant or far away with this the choices listed would they be like of government organizations or you can could you go to nonprofit? and that's not through taxes well i i, or, I don't necessarily know the answer to that question okay. but i think there um there are lots of different ways to implement this idea of tax yeah. choice and we're going to get to a couple of them. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to take you on this little trip with me and if you for you driving in the car or sitting at home listening or my mom just What's that? We'll Hi, Mom. Keep that dial tuned to 90.1 KZSU Stanford. We're mm -hmm. right here on Modern Education. We're about to tell you a little bit about tax choice as a maybe alternative to a different way of looking at funding. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea basically right now is that funding is determined by Congress. Yes. Right? So they vote on it. The politicians have complete control over that. And as we were just talking about in the last segment, there is uh, a lot of input from big business and industry that is able to sway that a bit, right? Mm -hmm. Now, with this idea of tax choice, and oh, my mom just texted me. She really oh. is listening. Oh, she's great. My biggest Hello. fan. Okay. But the idea is basically if we can give people choice in where their money is being spent, that choice will by default create a, uh, a social influence on where government spending is happening. Uh -huh. And the reason why this would be such a big deal is because if you take as a, as a given that right now, big business and corporations are getting an undue sway in the way spending happens and in what kind of policies are being enacted mm -hmm. because they have the money and resources to be able to do something about it. Yeah individuals largely don't really have that ability. We don't have to say to choose right. like where their money went. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But if you gave people even 10% of their, their their tax contributions to be allocated as they saw fit, which if you think about it, that's a very, very small amount, right? If I paid $10 in taxes, which would mean I am flat broke and really hurting. <laughs> if I did, though, that would mean yeah. only $1 I got to choose where it went. 
which is not that big of a deal, right? You can imagine with the other $9, you can keep all major um, necessary things funded and moving forward. And that 10%, what it does is it creates a way to fight back. Because collectively, if people start choosing things Brings like back to the people, schools yeah. and, and infrastructure and things like that about where they would like their allocation to go, yeah. and collectively people are showing that that is where their preference is, it changes things quite a bit because it creates the ability for lots of people to have a sway towards what is actually popular. Mm -hmm. Now, this researcher, Kate Lamberton, actually found that across the board, either Democrats, Republicans, it didn't matter that if you gave people this choice, more money went into social good uh, projects, yeah. more money went into things like education and less money went to things like military. And I at, mean, of course, because it's going back to the people and what I mean, any average person who doesn't isn't keeping informed with government and big government terminology what's happening what affects them is immediately that their town to what they see what their kids are learning exactly. what and services this, are provided right yeah and so what you're describing right there is shortening the distance yeah between the spending and the results because humans I in general yeah. such a great idea because it brings back like well money equals power and right. if we are able to one, give that decision. And America's all about freedom, so it should be okay. But like that freedom to choose where you want a portion of your money to go, I think 10% is reasonable as well. Absolutely. And yeah, I really like that you brought up the point about Americans really enjoying their freedom. And that is actually uh, from a research and a psychological standpoint, one of yeah. the big, big sticking points for why this is a good idea, because compulsory taxes are well known and have been researched to do something, cause something called psychological reactants. What's that? Well, it's basically the idea that being forced into something causes you to react negatively to it. You get negative feelings, okay. negative, negative interpretations. We you really want the freedom don't, to be able yeah, to choose it yeah. yourself. I, I don't know. Other countries may not have that same psychological reactance to this particular issue. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe more collectivist societies because they uh, have a more Definitely. like deeply ingrained cultural way of thinking about contribution to a larger whole. But in America... We are very, very much into our independence and Individual, choice, yes, freedom, rights, things like this are very important to us and highly emotionally charged. Mm -hmm. So when we give people no choice, a compulsory charge, they're pissed about it, essentially. Yeah. Nobody likes taxes, right? We, what do we compare taxes most readily with? I don't know. Death. Okay. Yes, it's death all, and taxes. You can't avoid death or taxes. Yes. And it's like... I think the large part of why that's such a, a close, easily associated thought is because we really don't want to die and we really don't want to give our hard earned money away. <laughs> don't want to give It taxes. feels a little bit like dying when you're handing over <laughs> hours and hours and days and months and years of your life. Part of your paycheck. To compulsory over. payments, yeah. right? It's like um, back in uh, medieval times, this would be like the guy coming around and beating up your family if you don't pay enough taxes that year. That's kind of mm -hmm. like, that's almost what's still happening, yeah. except now the IRS does it with an official letter and it seems much less personal, but it's the same basic Just passive thing. passive aggressive. Yeah, right, right. Passive aggressive letters. <laughs> you better get your money in. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So this idea just of um, giving choice, tax choice, has has been shown to really decrease that that psychological reactance. I can see that. I mean, because you're going back. I feel like that. Yeah, if you have at least ten percent of a say of where your money is going, it feels like at least there's ten percent of my paycheck and my time and my death right. of my to the paycheck <laughs> that I am actually putting it to something that I like can actually benefit. I can actually make something. Like, let's say, yeah, that year. I had a bad, like, uh, I saw something bad in education and the school I went to, I would go and put that money towards education. Right. Or if I had worries about, I don't know, X, Y, Z, you have that ability to go over and put it up, put it there. The only thing I, the only thing I'm concerned of is uh, kind of relating to my question a bit earlier was if taxes would only go to government agencies or it can go to like individual organizations, because if people started just putting their money I'm only thinking right now in Trump America of like, let's say <laughs> that they wanted to put their money towards the NRA. Right. 
like and so now the NRA is continually getting more money, but now it's tax dollar money of like people funding right, right thing or like agencies, associ- associations, organizations that not okay. This is my opinion, not necessarily benefit society. Sure. Well, you know, I can I can uh, maybe alleviate a few of your concerns there. Okay. Because you've, already, you've always got this. You're like. Let me just calm you down for a second, take you back to ground zero. Don't worry, I got you. Let's <laughs> exactly. do this. Okay, so here's the thing. Part of what would happen if we got some of this uh, tax choice is that the spending that comes out of that is going to more closely align with the social desirability of actual people. Yeah. Now, your point is well taken because the NRA is essentially privately funded now, which gives at least some strong evidence that there are a lot of people that support things like that. Yes. Now, in, uh, you know, brass tax, I don't think that would be a problem right now because there's so many barriers to implementing something like this mm. that even if we decided to start implementing it, it would very much be um, pigeonholed into only being things that are already being funded. Yeah. So it would be very hard to overcome that barrier. And I think that would be a good thing. So it would start where it's already going. It would start using all of the available and needed programs and fundings that we're already trying to do. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, the interesting thing is large scale, full implementation of something like this would be very hard because it'd be such a big change. It would be a big change. Although it's actually very feasible and very reasonable even to think about doing this on smaller scales, talking local and state elections and things of that nature. Yeah. And, you know, sort of key budgetary decisions that are more closely aligned with what people actually want or need, not necessarily like hospital spending. Like I can say, let's just protect that for now until we have, you know, kind of like in the government problems, but uh, shut down, you have the essential services. There right. would be like a list Right, exactly. Of like, you can't touch this part of the budget. Exactly. And I think it's perfectly reasonable, at least in the short term, to be thinking yeah. that should stay, right? But in long term, maybe even that could start changing because the reality is a government and a society is, especially here, supposedly supposed to be by the people and for the people. Yeah. So if your spending is not reflecting people's actual desires and needs... And I think it's important to include needs there because desires are very frivolous and can very change can, yeah. can change depending on what commercial you just saw or, yeah. you know, what kind of mood you're in. So I think needs need has to stay at the top of the list and be protected in a lot of ways because people uh, have a short sight for what is really important. Mm. They may not vote on, you know, building a new, um, I don't know, high speed transportation across the country because they don't want to travel across the country that often. Mm. But the reality is something like that could be a game changer. So we have it to think be. about, you know, there, there's a lot of intricacies here. So yeah. I'm not going to pretend there's an easy fix. But the basic nuts and bolts is you can do this and you could start it on a pretty small scale and roll oh, yeah. it out progressively over, you know, the, the cycle of a few elections. OK. And so it wouldn't be that hard to implement, really. And, uh, you know, there's, there are some other problems like budget shock, right? So budget shock would be the idea that if you tried to implement and jump in to, you know, like jump in free, feet first right into this mm. is there could be a, a, a period of, you know, years in between elections where vital programs wouldn't be getting adequate funding because mm, of I like see. too large of an implementation of this process. So it definitely there are plenty of good arguments for a slow rollout yeah. and sort of starting at the bottom. Are, and isn't it way like up. kind of a rule with most things that it's better to go at gradual, like than incremental to have it go. change yeah. versus disruption? Yeah. Uh, well, there's definitely some some arguments on both sides for okay. that. I think um, historically incremental change has been the more lasting. Mm -hmm. As far as, you know, if going back hundreds of years, the real changes that we've made needed to be incremental because the the social memory of everything that's going on well, is really hard to sidestep. Yeah. yeah. People have an expectation. They have an understanding. And when their social expectations are not being met, it becomes sort of uh, dissonant to our way of seeing the world. They could be like upset with the government for completely changing things. Yeah, or just confused, not know how to act, confused, not know how to yeah. integrate into this new way of doing things. Now, the other side of that is disruption, 
right? Mm -hmm. Which is the idea of drastically and um, blatantly tearing down the old and trying something new. Mm -hmm. Now, that has happened in the past as well. And sadly, like the the thing that's coming to mind for like a really old school version of that is Mm -hmm. like the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to go tear down everything that's that's been done and rebuild it in the image of what we want. Mm -hmm. Now, historically, that didn't work out so well as like a high point in our moral judgment. Right. But the point of it is, is that it can be done. And I think a more salient example would be like Airbnb or Uber. So these have disrupted big industries and essentially torn them down in a lot of ways. Yes, that is with true. With very little infrastructure, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's where an idea can take off long before legislation is able to even catch up. And that's actually where we're at right now. That is exactly what I was about to say. That's exactly where we are. Right, right. And so this this uh, this dissonance between yeah. innovation being disruptive versus being incremental or you know change in general it's there's no good answer it really does depend on the space it depends yeah the the context what it is like what you are implementing like for example i'm thinking of just the internet like something like that was that was disruptive but it also took time to fully disrupt it um so it also has its own layers of like some things that if they come in and it's new they want you want to try to change something and typically i think what's most interesting is through communication is like how if your communication changes the way that you talk to people and interact is completely disrupted a new form of how you think or how how governments work and the internet was something that completely disrupted like almost every aspect of society it abs- it still is really yes it and, still is 100%. yeah yeah and it's funny you know i mean when the, when the printing press was invented mm-hmm. people said oh that's never going to catch on nobody wants books to be easily printed yeah. and able to be read by the masses most people can't even read what a dumb invention mm-hmm. and then the printing press stayed around a little longer and then people had access to books and it changed the world literacy rates went up yeah right right and and access to information and yeah. knowledge sort of uh, spurred out beyond just clergy and scholars and things of that mm-hmm. nature. And back then it was clergy and scholars were basically the same thing. There was no difference, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. the, you know, the basic idea is was the same with the internet. When the internet first came out, people were joking like, yeah, what, what is this ridiculous is invention? My right? well, I mean, even, that's my side. Even before that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, people were so, and they always, I think will be so against these large um, sort of, drastic and disruptive changes Mm -hmm. and the thing is is you can't you can't stand in the way of progress that's the thing yeah and to even know like okay when history is continuing okay is it will it continue in such a way where this idea will keep growing and growing and growing i mean all that an idea is is if it's reached enough people and they're convinced then it's become like enough to say it for that society so for a lot of things that are shifting it makes me wonder, okay, so what ideas are really going to take root and which ones are going to kind of just dissolve away? And I think a lot of the old mm-hmm. is just going to continue to dissolve away. Well, you know, there is a, there is, there is a long memory in culture and society that's really hard to erase. So it is difficult. But, you know, at the same time, change can happen sort of without us even realizing what's happening because... Yeah. Once we have access to a new way of doing things or we can see yes. a new possibility, you can't undo that. You know, That's fam- why I say like, it, the Internet's completely changed it. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. And there's a there's a great quote yeah. from uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he said, uh, one's mind, once stretched by a new idea, can mm. never regain its original dimensions. Mm. And I really love I like that, that. Right. It because it's like a visual yeah. I yeah. Like and it's so true, too, yeah. because you can go your whole life without ever, say, having pizza and you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> you have no idea how wonderful pizza is mm-hmm. and what it can do to improve your life. But then once you have that first taste, pizza, you're never going to go back. Pizza, 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 right? Pizza. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it's this idea of yes, I get it. what we do and what we're aware of and what we accept as possible yeah. changes us and it arguably changes us forever and it's one of those things where 
it's not that hard to change society if you can give people a view and a vision of what it could look like. And I think all that really is is experience. Having people around you saying these things, having real experiences that could unite and yeah, yeah. bring that together. Because the only thing and, that I think really changes people is if they see it themselves or like yeah, experiencing it themselves. Right. Honestly. Right. Well, you know, there's there is um, I'm reminded of Joseph Campbell's work and mm -hmm. he he, uh, he wrote a really famous book that has really shaped a lot of media and uh, the hero of a thousand faces is the name of the book. But Heard of it. yeah, in this book, he, he talks about archetypes and storytelling and how stories become the sort of anchors that we hang our experiences on. Yeah. And humans, you know, since we've existed the entire time we've ever existed, we have told stories. Mm -hmm. And so we are very much yeah. um, primed to receive it, new information and new experiences through the storytelling story. medium. Right. Is that why, that's why Hollywood's so big. It's like true. Like we were talking about Avengers. Do you think people will, I don't know, frame their stories off of superhero characters? I do. And, you know, that I mean. That would be like pretty insane, kind of like acting like you're a superhero, but you just went to your work and had yeah. a bad day with your coworker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you look at some of the recent superhero movies, like the Wonder Woman and mm. the Black Panther movies, these were huge mm. and they really made like a, a real difference in thinking about ourselves to people who haven't had the uh, the representation. I mean, um, you know, yeah. I remember I went and saw Wonder Woman with my partner and at the time and when we went to go see it, uh -huh. we came out and she said, wow, I now understand how it must have felt to grow up as a boy. And think that you could do anything mm. because we had all these male models of, you know, superheroes and look what you can do. Yeah. Look, Superman can fly. Batman can create all these cool toys. And those are models that anyone can look up to. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot harder to identify with a model that doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, yes. doesn't act this like is you. 100% and does, true. And I've seen it a lot through advertising as well. Right, right. And it's it's one of those things where if you don't have a model to follow, a person to look at and say, hey, it looks like that. And that's the thing that we're doing. So that's what we need to try to emulate. Yeah. And this idea of archetypes is giving us yeah, the idea we? that there is a model to look at, to emulate, and to sort of aspirationally try to achieve. And when yeah. we don't have those models, it feels impossible to move forward. Well, it's all about who's who's out there. What are you seeing? What right. are your, um, this is terrible. What's that word when you look up to someone? <laughs> Mentor. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No. But when you have like good, good examples around you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, mentors, guides, models. I like the word good modeling models. Good because models, a yeah. model is both something you can look at as a guide. Yeah. And it's also something you can do. You can model another person's behavior. Yeah. So when you have a model to look at, it gives you a way to emulate. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because even if we're making improvements, those improvements are usually through emulating what already exists and then improving on it. So we need to be good role models to the government and show them <laughs> how they should emulate us. I like where you're going with this. I don't know what to do with it yet, but <laughs> me neither. <laughs> we're just about out of time. Well, can you believe it's been another hour on a wonderful Friday never afternoon? Can. I know it goes by so fast. So best way to spend it. We have had a wonderful time being your hosts here at Modern Education, and we hope you've had a wonderful time listening in. This is Ben Woodford and Emily Keelas here in the KZSU studio. Yes, yes. And Hello. we are going to be signing off for the week, and we will come back next Friday, this coming Friday, mm -hmm. from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Like we are here every week, we will have a new topic, possibly a new guest, and a whole bunch of new talk for you to tune into. We hope you will tune in each week. Coming up next is Scott Moulton with Party Time. He is always throwing down the hardcore techno jams, and it is Definitely one of my favorite ways of getting home after a wonderful oh, yeah. show here. Jam up Always jungle. jamming. Yeah, absolutely. So we hope you'll stay. Keep the dial tuned right here to 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is Ben Woodford. With Emily Kiles. And we are signing off here for Modern Education.